All right. So excited everybody's here. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, I'm happy you're here. What a great way to end out 2023, right? Together as a body of believers, worshiping together, celebrating our successes. And today we're going to talk about, I'm going to get right in my point because I only got a little bit of time. Today we're going to talk about keeping an open mind and heart about what God is doing for 2024. So some of you know this, some of you don't. I grew up in Spain. And in Spain, we have this amazing tradition called castells. There it is. And if you look here, these people are building a tower out of nothing but human bodies, uh, flexibility, teamwork, muscle. I don't even know. Like, you see this bottom layer here? This isn't even the bottom layer. They're all on top of a layer of, I don't know, like hundreds of people. This is really kind of an amazing thing they do. And at the top, all right, maybe this isn't the best picture to blow up, but at the top, there's a kid. It's always a kid because they weigh a little bit, right? And so they can get up to the top. They're not heavy, right? And so they've got stories that they're, they're taller than the building that they're standing in front of, right? And there's no structure other than just working together and the teamwork that goes with that. So the um, <clears throat> uh, UNESCO, so Castells were declared by UNESCO to be among the masterpieces of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. They're saying this is, this is kind of an amazing thing that people do, right? This is something that stands out, gets our attention, and just really kind of blows our mind. Well, I imagine that Paul might have been thinking about this um, when he wrote Romans, or maybe not this activity, because I don't know if they did it back then, but something like this, right? Um, so uh, Romans 12, I'm just going to read that really quick for you guys, uh, 4 through 6, if you want to check me in the churches under your seats, uh, page 944, it says, uh, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things. So if God has given, us, given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teachers, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. It is by giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And so he goes through kind of this list, list of gifts that God has given. And uh, there's a similar sentiment echoed in 1 Corinthians, um, where he goes into this long list about, uh, you know, the body has an eye, has an ear, has a hand, has a foot. And if you say, I'm not an eye, I can't be part of the body. And what the whole eye was ears. Like, you know, what would you, how would you see anything if the whole body was ears? And he kind of draws this absurd picture, right, of what the body would be like if it was all one thing. And he says, it takes a lot of different things. Looking back at our picture, the people at the bottom are not doing the same thing as the people in the middle or closer to the top or even that kid that's all the way at the top, right? They're all doing a different job. They're all interlocking arms. They're all working together for one common goal, but everybody has a different job here, right? There's a ton of people at the bottom. There's fewer and fewer as you go up. Just, you know, that's a physics thing, weight. Um, so, and he, and he goes in, he, he draws this picture, like everybody has to do their own special part or it doesn't work together. Um, the first, he sums up that whole passage in 1 Corinthians 12 um, with this verse that I think is, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. So God is in all of this. God is in everything that we do here, in all the different gifts, and we all have a different part to play. We don't all do the same thing. We don't all come up here and stand. We don't all, we don't all work in children's. We don't all uh, work, uh, work on the worship team. We all have different jobs, but it all comes together to make something amazing. So going back to my growing up in Spain, one of my biggest uh, frustrations as a kid that grew up in the church was going to youth camps, specifically because of this event at the end of every youth camp where the the leader would get up they'd have the big worship thing and like everybody okay we've preached like this is what we're all about and then they'd ask they'd say you know who here has committed to give their life to Christ my hand would shoot up 
And then they'd always follow it with a statement to go into full-time ministry. And my hand would come back down. (laughs) Because that wasn't, I knew from a very young age, John talks about knowing from the age of nine or 10 um, that he was called to to ministry, to be in full-time ministry, to be a pastor of a church. Like John knew that. I knew just as clearly that that wasn't my calling, that I was called to what I called godly laity. Like it wasn't my job to be the pastor, we're getting there. Uh, it wasn't my job to be the pastor. It was my job. I led life groups. Uh, we, I, we, I started teaching uh, Sunday school, actually, with Jenny. We'll get there. Uh, to, it, at the age of 13 and basically was in Sunday schools for, for three decades. Um, I, I uh, did all the ministry of the church as a layperson. I know, Craig, you have a similar story. Um, this that was I, I knew that was my calling. And so... It was my job to do that. Now, some of you are asking, right, what, what changed? Because John introduced me as the kids' pastor. Well, a couple years ago, um, the, God took us through a season of just intense no's. Everything was a no. Everything that John and Joanne asked us to do, we were like, hey, we went to God, and I don't know why, but he said no. Um, and that, that just seemed absurd that we were going through this season of intense no's. But I, I really believe it was so that God would create in us this expectancy of, like, God, just give us a yes, right? Like, just tell us we can do whatever we ask. And so we went through that season of no's, 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 no's. And we just really, we were really seeking out, like, God, what is the next thing that you have for us. And so when this opportunity to become the children's pastor uh, came before us, we were like, oh, that's the thing. And so even though we had this long history of knowing what God was doing in our life, knowing what I called godly lady, that was our, that was our specific calling, that then when God was ready to change us, he prepared us to it, right? Because I might have hesitated after three decades of pursuing one, like this is the direction God gave me, I might have hesitated if he had just been like, hey, I have a new direction for you. And so he prepared our hearts by giving us all these no's to be ready to give us a yes. And when he gave us a yes, we were yes. And it's been six months and it's been awesome. And so my encouragement to you is to think about where you fit in here, where, what part of the body you are, to look at this and realize that if you know, if that, if that guy the right out there lets go, the 12 people ahead of him just fall to the ground. And they, honestly, it's, it's actually a very dangerous activity. Um, if they lose their grip or whatever, it's, it's a big deal. We all have a role to play where it doesn't come together the right way. And so my encouragement to you is to know what your role is, to find that role, but most of all, to keep an open mind and heart about what God is doing, because your role in 2023 might not be your role in 2024. And so be open to what God is saying for you for the next year. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Jenny Kanenko. I'm the other half of the Kids Pastors team. Um, this month that we're just finishing up today is our sixth month of being the Kids Pastors here at One Life. So we're celebrating that and just that big accomplishment. Um, I will say, I usually talk to kids. I'm the kids pastor, so I appreciate that there's a lot of kids in the room today, and also if you adults could kind of connect with your inner child and just like wiggle more in your seats or maybe like raise your hand to ask a lot of questions or run around the room a little bit or need to go to the bathroom, that'll make me feel a lot more comfortable. Um, Okay, so I, when we started as kids pastors here, when Luke and I started, God gave us this vision of, for our kids ministry, of heavenly treasures. Um... This is one of our core verses for our ministry and the thing that we go back to over and over. And it is Deuteronomy 18. It says, The Lord has declared today that you are his people, his own special treasure, just as he promised, and that you must obey all of his commands. And um, we really believe in our ministry that it is not just our kids who are our treasures, our, our God's treasures, also our volunteers. Um, Obviously, all of our kids are treasures, but our volunteers are just as much his own special treasure. And we see our job as volunteers as primarily, um, the, our role is to equip God's people to do his work. Um, so we, 
we refer back to the verse in Ephesians that says, now these are the gifts God, in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Um, and because of this verse, and that this is how we're building, this is what we've kind of, the foundation of our ministry, um, The key parts of this verse that you see up here are that Christ has given this responsibility to the church, to everyone in the church, not just the roles that are called out here, but to the church at large. Um, And that responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church. That is our collective job together as um, servants of Christ. Um, So I'm going to tell you a story about some people that really modeled this really, really well for me and for Luke and is a big reason why we're standing here in front of you today. Um, I was raised in the church. My parents got saved right before I was born. Um, I attended the same church for the first 12 years of my life. Um, And so every year I went to Sunday school. And in second grade, I went to Sunday school with Len and Marianne Harris. And I brought a picture for you guys to see because they're really sweet. Um, And uh, Len and Marianne got saved and were immediately thrown into Sunday school like two weeks later. They were like, hey, you should teach all these kids. And so they started faithfully teaching second grade Sunday school every week. And a few years after they started serving, I was in second grade and I was one of their students in their class. And they um, they just, they have a singular gift for loving people and making kids feel seen and noticed and loved and special. And I looked forward to their class so much every week as a little second grader. Um, It was just a phenomenal time, and I really benefited from their intentional love of me as a kid in their ministry. Well, fast forward 12 more years, I'm back at this church um, after living in Spain, and I'm dating this really cute guy, and he says, "Um, hey, I'm serving in Sunday school. Do you want to serve with me? And I was like, sure, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds great. So lo and behold, who's still the superintendents of that Sunday school? Len and Mary Ann Harris. Um, and they, they were still faithfully serving, but now they were, now I was experiencing them as a leader under their leadership instead of as a kid. And as a leader, they just taught both Luke and I so much about healthy leadership and modeling this, this vision we have of investing in the current generation as well as the next generation. So they allowed us to teach lessons, to lead worship. They helped us create curriculum. Anytime we had an idea, hey, what if we did this? They'd be like, yes, that's a great idea. How can we help you? How can we support you so that you can carry out this idea that you have? Um, they... They would, if we suggested, like, I think this song is a great song for the kids to learn, they'd be like, yes, how can we help you? They would have us over for dinner individually. They would have our team over for dinner. And they, you know, had a personal interest in every one of our, our lives. Um, and even now, I, I have not been... I moved here almost 10 years ago, and they still reach out to us regularly and ask us how we're doing and how can we pray for you and what's going on with your kids. They send my kids birthday presents and packages and um, just love them so well. And um, they've faithfully prayed for us. They even learned how to text so that they could communicate with us better because we were not great at returning their emails. So they were like, okay, we'll learn how to text if that's easier for you. Um, so they've just really invested in us over the years. Um, Len and Marianne spent 42 years teaching second grade Sunday school, faithfully serving, never did anything else, never went splashier, bigger, fancier, got recognition for anything other than they just faithfully led that uh, Sunday school. But the countless kids that went through their ministry and the countless leaders that were raised up through their intentional leadership has been life-changing, right? And we are applying that same model here at One Life. We are investing in our leaders, and we have leaders in kids' group that we have brave seventh graders that are like, okay, I'm going to learn how to lead a small group. Here we go. I'm going to do this. We have fifth graders who are rocking babies and loving on your babies. We have uh, leaders faithfully vacuuming up tiny little pieces of paper every week and picking up fruit snack uh, wrappers and whatever else needs to be done. We have leaders in their sunset years that are... Um, just investing in our kiddos week after week. We're watching these awesome treasures, both kids and adults, blossom before our eyes as they grow into the roles that God has placed on their hearts. It takes a small army 
to run kids. You saw we have 170 kids on average. The week before Christmas, we had 177 kids across all of our classes. Um, so we obviously need a lot of volunteers for that. Um, every one of our leaders is a treasure that God has given to us to steward well. And it is our responsibility to invest in them, to equip them, and prepare them for the work of the ministry. Um, so obviously I've talked about kids ministry cause that's what I do. Um, but you might serve in hospitality or a parking lot or cleaning, or there's so many different roles at the church. And my challenge to you is to not just look at how you are serving, but to look at who can you be investing in and bring alongside of you? Who are you investing in that's younger than you, that you can be that Lena Marian Harris and bring them alongside of you so that hopefully in the next, when it's time for them to take over, they're ready to go because you've done your responsibility of inf investing in someone who's younger than you. Isn't the body just awesome? <laughs> like, I mean, just Luke and Jenny, just so good. Um, and I, I know we're all getting up and we're kind of letting you into our ministries today, but, but we're just, as a church family this morning, what we're doing is we're looking at what God has done. And just, so just praise God for those things. Praise God. I mean, yeah. Can we, can we just like praise him? I mean, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk about youth, kind of let our church family into what's going on there. Um, and so to do that, we're going to do three things. Number one, we're going to look at some scripture. Number two, we're going to look at 2023. And then we're going to look ahead to 2024. Sound good? All right, let's look at some scripture. If you have your Bibles, John 6. John 6, I'm going to read out of verse 67 through 69. I'm just going to go for it. Here we go, verse 67, John 6. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So you'll see why I'm talking about this verse uh, in a second, how it kind of ties into the youth. But you got to understand what's happening in John 6. Okay, the first couple of chapters of John, Jesus has done some miracles. Okay, disciples have seen some miracles. The crowds have seen some miracles. Jesus has turned water into wine. He's healed the man at Bethsaida. He's taught John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Like, he's done some pretty incredible stuff, and he's starting to get some followers, okay? People are starting to understand. They're following him. There's crowds following Jesus. There's some religious people, some Jewish religious people following Jesus. Jesus. And in John 6, he kind of starts to turn up the heat on his teaching a little bit. And, and he says some pr crazy claims. He goes, I'm the bread of life. And then he goes to this crowd that's following him and he goes, hey, I'm actually going to raise some people from the dead. And then he goes and he says this thing where he's like, eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's how you're going to have eternal life. And we understand that because of the cross, right? This is why we do communion, the little McUnion cups, right? We're washed in the blood of Jesus. His body was broke. For, we get that. But imagine you're in John 6. You're following this dude because he just fed 5,000 people. He just walked on water. You're so in love with him. And then he's like, you got to eat me. And they're like, what? Okay, they're like, what is going on? And people start to leave because it's hard. This crowd starts to dip. There starts to be this alternative thing. And so all of a sudden we're in this scene with Jesus and his disciples and he looks at his disciples and he says, John 67, he says, do you want to go away as well? And Peter has this moment where he looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, we, where else do we go? You have the words of life. And then number two, we've come to know that you're Christ, you're Messiah, you're Jesus. So Peter has, okay, so how, how does this, can we fire it up? How does this tie in with youth? And so guys, when we think about Gen Z, uh, most people define Gen Z as, as, as a people, as, as kids, as youth discipled by secularism and social media and garbage and LGBTQ and confusion, right? And all that, that's, that's, when you think of Gen Z, you, you, that may be a definition that you've heard that you have. And what I want to share with you today, both across the country and in this church, is there is a portion, a piece of Gen Z having this same interaction with Jesus, going, Jesus, I don't know where else to go. I, I believe you have the words of life and that you are the son of God. You are who you say you are. That is happening in our generation. And that's happening in this church, okay? 
So we, we have kids coming in from this broken world, and, and at youth group, we're just exalting Jesus. We're not, we're not sitting around eating pizza here on Wednesday nights. We are exalting Jesus. We're in, we're in a glory portal. We're on our faces meeting the living and active God. And we're, we're getting a high view of his word. We're saying, we don't want to listen to TikTok. We don't want to listen to what the world says. We don't want to listen to, 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 to our, our worldview will be defined by Christ and what he says. And, and, and not only is that happening on Wednesday nights and Sundays, but then students' lives are changing. I mean, if I had time, I'd tell you guys story after story after story of parents call me. Man, my, my kid's praying for their neighbor. I got kids coming to my office. Hey, I got, I got to break off this relationship. I got to get holy. I got to consecrate myself. I got to walk in power. I want to go into my school, and I, I want to learn how to share the gospel. So that's happening in our generation. And so I just want you to know that. I want you to feel stirred by that. And then as we kind of kind of look at today at church, hey, we're, we're still at church. We want the word too. I'm happy to say, guys, that this is what our church is doing too. We are, we are, we're, we're an 800 person church. We're a big church. But this church family is looking at Jesus in South Denver and Aurora saying, we're not going to choose the alternative. When things get tough, Jesus, we have come to know that you have the words of life. Yeah. We're going to live by that. We're going to disciple our families by that. We're going to do Sunday by that, right? Yeah. And then, Jesus, you're the Christ, the Messiah. And we literally believe you're coming back someday, and we're going to be a people eagerly, earnestly waiting for you. So we're doing that as a church. And so as we head into 2024, let's continue to do that continue to have this, you yourself have this conversation with Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to cling to your word. I'm going to get into this thing. I'm going to know how you view the world and view people and view life. And Jesus, I'm going to be convinced and understand the story I'm wrapped up in. That you're Christ, you're Messiah, you died on a cross, you rose again, and you're coming back for me. And my job right now as a human being on this planet is to, to get people ready for when you come back. Cool? All right, sweet. I'm not going to match his energy. <laughs> how, how blessed are our students to have him as our youth pastor, you guys? And our kids to have Luke and Jenny? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely incredible. Well, so far, really what we've been trying to like communicate is that there's so much to celebrate here at One Life. But we want to celebrate more than just what's happening in this building. We want to celebrate what's happening in the Capital C Church. Right. We want to talk about and celebrate how people are getting saved daily across the world, accepting Jesus' salvation, becoming consumed by his fire. That's what we're celebrating. And as individual followers of Christ, we have things that we can celebrate, things that he's done in our lives. And I've, I've found, at least for me personally, it's a very easy to give God praise for the things that he's doing when they're not personal when they're kind of separated from us by a little bit. But when they're our own lives, it's very easy to get caught up in that. Well, I did this. So we don't give God the credit that he so fully deserves. So if you haven't guessed by me being the one talking, I'm talking about worship. Shocking. Um, and I, I don't have a ton of time. I'm not going to give a dissertation. We're, we're just going to focus on why we're called to worship. There's a, there's a conversation to be had about how, and I, I would like to direct you guys, uh, if you're curious about how the Bible tells us to worship, uh, Colossians 3.23, all of Psalm 100, and Hebrews 12.28. Very good verses that teach us how we are called to worship biblically, but that's not, that's not the focus. Maybe Joanna will get her worship series one day. Uh, <laughs> Here at One Life, we, we provide an opportunity to worship God every Sunday through the music, but there are more ways than just singing happy songs. All of our life is worship. But we're going to start just by looking at 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 29. It says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And this exact phrasing is repeated in Psalm 29 too. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. These are actually CSB. I did that wrong. I use a lot of... 
Bible translations. Um, I can't tell you which one is referencing which, but it really doesn't matter because the messaging is exactly the same. We ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. The Bible says that our worship is something that God is due. It's something that is due is something that is owed to them. It is their right. And that's, that's a little bit aggressive. <laughs> who, who is the Bible to tell me that, I, that God has a right to my worship, to my praise? Uh, there are two answers to that question then. And they kind of go hand in hand. One, God is worthy of our worship because of who he is. And two, he's worthy of our worship because of what he's done. That that is why we worship. And to to save time, I'm not going to read the rest of Psalm 29, but I'd like to give you a taste of what the rest of it says. It says that the Lord's voice is powerful, full of majesty. He makes the wilderness tremble and he strips the forest bare. He sits enthroned over the flood, enthroned as king forever. See, Psalm 29 is examining who God is, and it's focusing on his power. When we sing songs up here on the stage, we sing a lot about the attributes of God. We sing about his holiness, his beauty, his glory, and all of those things. We we sing those attributes to celebrate how God is the source of all of those things. See, the, the, the reason why there are mountains that exude power, oceans that can rip and tear a boat to shreds, a beautiful flower, every, every living thing, the source of those attributes, beauty, power, righteousness, they come from God. And that's why we worship him. He is the source of every good thing. So who he is? We've established that. But what about what he's done? Well, we see Psalms again. And this is the very next Psalm, uh, Psalm 30. It begins with this. I will extol you, Lord, for you have drawn me up. You have not let my foes rejoice over me. Oh, Lord, my God, I have cried to you for help and you have healed me. Oh, Lord, you have brought my soul up from Sheol. You have restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. And extol, just at the very beginning, is a fancy word that means praise enthusiastically. And what a word that is. Oh my gosh, praise enthusiastically. I believe that if you don't praise enthusiastically, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you may not fully understand what he's done for you. I'll say say that one again. If you do not praise enthusiastically, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you may not fully understand what he has done for you personally. But I digress. <laughs> the psalmist says you have a whole bunch in here. He's praising God for the things that he has done in the psalmist's life. He, he thanks God for protection, health, salvation. Just real quick, who feels that in their life, God has healed them in some way? Protected them from something. Saved them in some way. The, the last one feels especially popular in a church setting. Shocker. I don't, I don't mean to make it a gospel presentation because that was the point of last week, but let's just zoom in on the salvation part of that, right? Like when, when I say you may not fully understand what he's done for you, I'm not really even talking about the healings or the protection, the peace in the storm or uh, salvation in the fire. I'm talking about just the cross, yeah. period, full stop. What he did on the cross for us, the God of the universe, who created everything you can see and everything that you can't, that same God sent his son in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, down, and he lived a perfect, sinless life, and then he died a painful, shameful death. All of this so that he could raise from the dead, defeat sin and death, and restore us to to God. Yeah. (laughs) And that, that, with that one act of immeasurable love and mercy, the veil that separates the presence of God from us is torn. And when we worship in this room and we call on the presence of God to dwell in this place, he doesn't hold back anymore. He comes. The living, breathing presence of God fills this room. It fills our hearts. That's what happens when we worship. And I'll leave you with this. 
man, as we move into the new year and we continue to spend a little bit of time every Sunday morning worshiping God, before you begin to just sing another song, remember the price that was paid. Remember why you're singing, who he is and what he's done. And I'll leave you with one final verse. It's Hebrews 13, 15. It says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. It's because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we can give our enthusiastic praise for who he is and what he's done. Wow. You guys feeling excited yet? Come on. Wow, we won't talk about his, oh, how much time he went over his five minutes, but that's okay. <laughs> if it's about Jesus, time is, irre- is not relevant, right? I'm glad you said that because we're going till two o'clock. Here we go. <laughs> Mr. Dixon, you just fired me up, man. Let's go. Are you guys enjoying this? It's so good to hear some of this stuff, right? Man, we're here because we want to celebrate all that God has done. And if you're not have a heart of celebration, then you're not looking back and seeing the great things that God has done. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 77. It's on page 488 in the black Bibles around you. But since my hands are full, I'm not going to pull out my Bible. I'm going to read it off of the screen. I really wanted a headset because I have to talk with my hands and we're going to go. So Psalm 77 11 through 13 says this, but then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. O God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? That should be an amen. That's exciting. But this scripture is so interesting to me because if you were to read the verse right before that, the writer of this psalm is about ready to give up. The writer of this psalm right before that asks the question, God, have you taken your hand from me? That's why it's important to read all of scripture. Not just pinpoint one verse out because it makes you feel good. But I really love about this scripture is because it really changes bad thinking. It gets us to start thinking about all the great stuff God has done in the past. I don't know about you guys, but oftentimes I go the opposite direction. And I start thinking about all the bad things that happened. But this has really encouraged me. And man, I'm telling you, if you've been around one life this year at all, God has done some crazy stuff. Let's just review. We've said it a lot already. We've done some crazy stuff. Pastor John talked about the front parking lot. He acted like it was so no big deal. We just threw some tar down and some paint. No, that was a big deal. We tore that thing up. We repaved it and we repainted it. That's massive. Not only that, we ventured into replacing 15 of our 18 HVAC units. We did 14, the 15th is coming this week. We're praying for no snow. So the lobby is warm at some point. That's huge. And then Pastor John also mentioned our next gen space. We've been working on this project since, I don't know, September of this year, I think. It feels like it was going to never end. That's all I've been on. I was on the phone with contractors since September. And it's, it, man, we're ready. This Wednesday, we're going to have a you session in that room, and God's going to blow the house out. Come on. You got to just think of those three things alone. And you got to think, that's not normal for a church. A parking lot, HVAC, a massive reconstruction. That should change your thinking to say that's not normal to that's amazing. And the point of this is to draw us to God. Not to say how cool we are, 
Although some of you are pretty cool. Dude, that is a fly shirt, man, and I want it, okay? I'm not even sure that's cool language anymore. Fly, I just aged myself. I don't know, right? Okay, there you go. All right, good. <laughs> but that's amazing. Yes, let's go. That's just not normal for a church to take on and accomplish. God is good. But let's look at all the other things that's going on. All the smaller things that we just take for granted. We speak to it like it just happens, but it just doesn't happen. Pastor John mentioned all the life groups. Pastor John mentioned, maybe he didn't mention, but you guys remember Daddy Daughter Dance? Do you remember VBS? Do you remember all the retreats? Do you remember everything that goes on at this church? We, when we moved into this church, we were thinking we've got years to grow into this space. We we're already thinking, how do we blow out more? walls God is so good and then just Sunday alone have you been around one life for any length of time if you come to church on a Sunday unless you have a hard time breathing you've got to be experiencing the Holy Spirit in this place because when I leave Sundays I'm like that was awesome what can God do more. And then I come to church next Sunday and God does more. The fire of the spirit is moving and we're all catching fire. Let's go. I feel like I have, I have, maybe you, I don't know if you do or don't. I hope it catches fire to you, but I have, I can't miss a Sunday feeling. Because if I miss a Sunday, I might miss out on something cool that God's going to do. Matter of fact, Lee and I planned a vacation. We went to Myrtle Beach. But I planned it so we didn't miss a Sunday. We left Monday, come back Saturday. Don't miss Sundays. Don't miss Sundays. Which leads me to my main passage this morning. There's no way this is going five minutes, so you just better bu bu buckle up. Can't even say it. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 4. It's on page 1017 in the Bible that you have. And it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Come on. I could stop right there. But I still got three minutes. <laughs> the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seating in the place of honor beside God's throne. This is such a great section of scripture. And whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, you got to back up and you got to figure out why it's therefore. And if you see if, if in Hebrews and read chapter 11, it's great. It's called the great hall of faith. And it lists a whole bunch of saints from the Old Testament that it says by faith, they did something. By faith, Noah built the ark, just as an example. But then it gets to the latter part of Hebrews 11, and it says, not one of them saw the promises of God come to fruition. It's my version. But by faith. And so then it gets to Hebrews 11, and it says that, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses to the faith, that was written, Hebrews 11 was written to encourage us. I really love the imagery that, that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here. Because he puts it in a picture of a race. And it points to the races, the foot races of the ancient times of Israel and Greece. 
where they would have a foot race and there would be lines of people lined up in either in the Colosseum or by, and they would all be cheering on the racers. And so the imagery is this, that we're the rain runner. And we got all the saints of old cheering us on. Come on. Man, I don't know if you were at Christmas Eve last week. Raise your hand if you were at Christmas Eve. Okay? Come on. Who liked Christmas Eve? Right? I loved Christmas Eve. It was a long day. But I should have been tired. I got done after the fourth service and I'm going, I'm ready for number five. Let's go. I told Cole Walker on his way out, I go, Cole, I need a wake-up call every morning. You need to speak that spoken word to me so I can wake up. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you've got to go listen to the Christmas Eve service. Because it's amazing. So I'm here to point to not only do we have the saints of the Old Testament to cheer us on as we're running our race, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but we also have you and I to cheer us on. We also can look back in 23 and we can look at all the cool things that God has done at One Life Church and we can use that as encouragement for us to keep running, to keep running. Interesting. The verse goes on and says to strip off the excess weight and run the race that God set before us. Notice excess weight, especially the sin that trips us up. Two things jumped out at me as I was reading this passage. Two things. Sin. We all know sin. And we all know that it trips us, right? If you're running a race, that's the last thing that you want to do is to fall. That's what sin does. It makes you fall. We all know that, and we all need to get onto our knees, and we need to just confess, and we need to let God change us. But the one that really spoke out to me that I want to speak to just a little bit is the weight that slows us down. I'm not saying that the weight is good or bad, and we're not talking about physical weight. I'm just talking about things in our life that makes us not as effective for what Christ wants us to be and do. When I was in college, I backpacked a lot in the middle of winter, right? I was crazy back then. I'm a little so crazy, but I was really crazy back then. And we would, we would just throw everything we could into a backpack and we would strap on some cross country skis and we would just go, right? The backpack weighed like a hundred pounds. I don't know how much it was. There's, I'm sure there were some things in there that, that didn't matter. We'd get back and I'm like, I didn't wear half the stuff that was in the backpack. And I'm like, why did I take it? Maybe God is asking us in 24, why are we carrying this along? Let's get rid of it so that we're not slowing down. Man, how do we do this? I think every one of us up here has said the same thing. It's all about Jesus. Because in verse 2, it says we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. I mean, that is a message for you and I individually, and I can guarantee you that is what the leadership here at One Life Church is doing. We have a laser focus on making Jesus famous here. In 2023, man, I've been super encouraged by all that God has been doing. And not only in this building, by seeing people that you have exercised your faith and activated your discipleship. It's so encouraging to me to see. That's why today is all about celebration. That's why today is all about all of the stuff that we mention. It should draw you to God on your knees and just say thank you. And we praise you. And I want to close with Philippians chapter 3. Verses 12 through 14. Because the Paul, the Apostle Paul, has the same vein. Where he talks about the imagery of running a race. And he says, not that I've already obtained all this. Or already have arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. 
Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. God is not done. Where are you at today? Where are you at in your life with Christ? Oh, come on. I love the Philippians verse that it says, I press on. I want to encourage you as you think about the close of 23 and as we move into 24, I want you to think about, man, we need to press on because God is doing some crazy stuff in 24 that we have never seen yet. It also says in Philippians 3 to forgetting what's in the past. That doesn't mean that we close our eyes and all the good things that God has done. That just means we can't rest. That just means that we can't rest on what God has done in the past. And we can't do the same things even though we'll do them, but we'll do them differently. And we'll give God more glory because God's going to do even more things in 24. And I press on to win the prize. Man, I just want to encourage you as we close this service to have a moment with God. Look at your life and say, God, thank you for what you've done in 23. But God, I am here and I want to press on to win the goal of 24. There's a cool little scripture in in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20. I challenge you to find it later, okay? It's around verse 24, 20, somewhere around there, where Paul, again, he's talking about, he's going back to Jerusalem. And this, if you know anything about the study, that's where Paul actually eventually ends his life, or they kill him in in Jerusalem, and he doesn't know what's going to happen. But he says that he's got to go, and he's got to complete the task that God has given him. And then it actually says this, that the task is that he's gotta be, he's gotta testify about the good news of the gospel. Man, that's our goal, right, folks? That's our goal, church, is we gotta be walking, breathing, loving testifiers of the good news of Jesus. Man, I just wanna encourage you. We're gonna close right now with this song. So worship team, if you're around somewhere, let's do this, so please stand. We're gonna do this. We do it in youth a lot, but please stand. And I want you to do this. I want you to hold your hands out like this. This is an act of, 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 of surrender, if you will. It's also an act of receiving. And I, as, we, as, as we just play the songs and, and, and just play the, the instruments, I just want you to have your own moment with God. With your hands outstretched, pray and say, God, thank you for the goodness of 23. And then pray, God, here I am. Take me where you want me. Do a new thing in me for 24. Do a new thing. Show me your glory. Show me what you want. Jesus' name, amen.